Hi everyone, welcome to Live from My Drum Room. I'm John DeChristopher, and uh, today I'm bringing you part one of a series of four episodes that I did to remember my dear friend and hero, the great Charlie Watts. Um, and in this episode, I'm, uh, I'm joined by Steve Gadd, Rick Murata, Andy Newmark, Stan Lynch, Michael Shreve, Steve Maxwell, Yard Gavrilovich, Kenny Jones, and John Ferraro. So sit back and enjoy this episode. Uh, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, live from my drum room. Also my podcast, which is available on all the podcast platforms. And, uh, and stay tuned for the episodes two through four to follow. Thanks very much. And uh, let's always keep Charlie in our hearts. Thanks, peace. So does everybody kind of know everybody or, or there's probably some introductions. Well, that... we do now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Who are you? I'm your worst nightmare, Rick. <laughs> Introduce yourself. I'm the host of this happy hour. Well, we know who you are. John, but John are... DeChristopher. I've who I've never you? had the I haven't had the pleasure of meeting Kenny Jones, but this is exciting to meet you. Yes. I've never had the pleasure of meeting myself either. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's pleased, <laughs> pleased to meet me. It's pleased to meet me <laughs> soon. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, and we'll we'll keep it we'll keep it fun. I just thought we could all you know, those of us who want to share a story or two can do that. And and uh, you know, I know a few of us have some some stories to tell. And uh, you know, just talk you start, about John. We'll, yeah, I, I I'll wait I'll wait for Andy to jump in, and then we'll we'll sort okay. of okay. We'll sort of kick it off, I guess, but give it a couple more minutes. He yesterday he said, "Oh, Stan, yes." I just have to say that um, the last time I saw Kenny Jones, I, I had hitchhiked to a gig in Tampa, and wow. the free free was opening for you guys at Tampa Stadium. Oh, wow, that's a while back. And man, it, it changed my life, dude. Between you and Simon Kirk, it just my head just my little Florida head just went. Oh my <laughs> God, that's a rock. Those are rock and roll bands, <laughs> and it, it's I've been that your tailpipe has been like right there the whole, I mean, it's just been, a, it's just- All a, I can do is apologize. Oh, <laughs> you, know, you, guys, you guys had a, I think you had an onstage bartender and it was like, and you were so good. Hey, look, look, look. Both, yeah. There you go. <laughs> but I just, just- It's happy hour over here. I just have to tell you, my, my heart, as a, you know, it was so worth it. I mean, I, I hitchhiked four hours, then I tried to go see, I, I hitchhiked, around Florida to find more of it. And it was, it was just extraordinary. And then of course I've seen you play since at the forum in LA and, you know, but I've, I have, I've just loved what you brought to the table. It, the, that wonderful British dignified pride behind the kid. Oh, you see. Oh no, it's, it's just, I just, it's just not wasted on me, man. That's oh, all. Thank you very much too. Oh. Same goes for me. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely well yeah. you know I, I i will tell i will um i'll tell a quick story i one one of probably a few that i might <laughs> that i may have to take say today or tell today but um and i think i read somewhere kenny that you spoke with charlie on his birthday this year i i called him on his on his 80th birthday and and uh and he was he was really you know sort of upbeat you know for charlie who's typically not very upbeat but he was uh you know, I just remember the conversation I had. He said, "You know, I might see you later. We might, we might be out later this year." I think at that time they were still sort of working out the details of of what this tour is now. But um, yeah, it it was a you know, as I look back at it, it was a sort of a bittersweet conversation. He was, but he was, and he said he'd been getting a lot of phone calls. So I think I read somewhere, Kenny, that you spoke with them that day presumably yeah, I, 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 I was with Ronnie Wood and we just been talking about it. so I called Charlie straight away and I said Charlie I just have to congratulate you you know I'm reaching 80 and I said I, 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 we had such a great time so we spoke for about half an hour on the phone talking about all the good times we had and having a good old laugh he didn't sound very well that day you know yeah and he struggled through his conversation but he was having a good laugh between between being not well, basically. Wow. Um, what yeah. was no, I think yeah, he knew I what was coming. Huh? I think he knew what was coming. Yeah. Oh, wow. What? 
Hey, John. Yes, I got Steve. a little tidbit along those lines. Uh, it was a really weird thing. For years and years, I've had Charlie's number in my cell phone, you know. And just before COVID, I bought a, a car, and that car, <clears throat> you know, downloads your numbers. And every time I'd get in the car over the last year and a half, and I'd, I'd press the button, you know, I'd voice command, say, call home. And when it says call home, two numbers came up. The first one would be Charlie Watts, and the next one would be my house. <laughs> okay. And and for all that last year and a half, I sat there and I said, oh, man, you know, I haven't talked with Charlie in so long. I should just press the button and call him. And I didn't do it, you know. Ooh. And now this happens, and every day I get in the car, and when I say call home, those two numbers still come up. But, man, I can't call him now, you know. Oh, and boy. You, you can always go. You can always go, Charlie. You'll be there. Well, well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's one of those things. I used to tell people, you know, if you want to reach out and make contact, do it. You know, I didn't call. Him. I said, oh, I don't want to bother him. You know, and you know, and but you know, you should just pick up the phone and say, Hey, man, I was just wanted to say, Hey, you know, that's it. And I should have, but I, I regret not having done that. But I can't take it out of my phone now. I got to leave it there. It's a reminder every time I look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you'll, you'll probably be making a lot more calls than you did in the past to different people, huh? <laughs> yeah, you know it, man. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Arnie Lang, my buddy over there, he does Gladstone replicas. I mean, he, he, he died at 90 just unexpectedly. Actually, in an interesting way, Arnie was a very sharp-dressed man, and, and uh, right to the end, he was 90 years old, and he fell, hit his head. Uh, but the interesting part of it, the fun part, he was going out at 90 years old, walking down to get a pedicure. All right. Oh, so how cool is that? Going down to get a pedicure at 90 years old. It's a, he yeah. lived a good life. Yeah. I knew there was a reason I wasn't going to go get a pedicure. <laughs> <laughs> 90 years old, I'm going to go down and get a drink. Yeah. Bingo, me too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll just say, Kenny, on that call that I had with him that day, I, I, I said, you know, Charlie, I've been doing these. He said, is your band playing? You know, what are you doing? And I said, I've been doing these video chats with some drummers and, and maybe there's something we could do. And he said, he said, you know, I, I, you know, I don't really do those things. And I said, well, I know. I said, it's I've, I've had Steve Gadd. I've had, you know, uh, Stan Lynch and uh, Andy Newmark and a bunch of guys. And um, and he said, well, you know, I. Uh, you know, he said, well, let me think about it. You know, I don't really have, I don't have a computer, but maybe one of the girls could help me do it. Um, and I think he might've been referring to his daughter or his granddaughter, or maybe even his wife. I don't know. But I had this, this idea that when they went on the road on one of his days off, he'd have nothing to do in his hotel one day. And, and uh, you know, we'd, we'd make it happen. So, but, um, but, you know, similar, I, I wish I had, thought of it you know sooner to try to make something happen because there's, there's so many things i think that people would like to know about charlie that you'd never really know unless you really sort of talk to him about it do you know what i mean he he was he, he's a man of of few words when it came to his his playing his drums his history you know um so yeah. say much, Char huh? charlie was a was a not was a nutty drummer <laughs> He's a good guy and a very quiet, lovely family man. And he loved loved horses, he loved drums, he loved jazz, he loved being alive and just being part of the furniture in a band. But yeah. um, I think every time we got together, we had a lovely time. We just talked about, I mean, there's no Keith Mooney, but, you know, we got no great stories about throwing stuff out, drums out of windows or stuff. But what we did do, Every time we got together, we I knew Charlie when he was drinking lots of wine and I don't know, just alcohol. But we had a good laugh and we had a sensible conversation. We never, never ever sort of a, had a, a heavy one uh, throwing things at each other. I don't know. Join I once I, I was in, in Lowe's Midtown in New York with John Bonham and we went down this English pub there and they saw what in his red barrel pints of beer. I mean, I had a competition. I said, I can't drink any more of this stuff, uh, John. So, and he kept drinking it. And uh, I, I kept drinking the brandy. I fell over. I couldn't keep up with him. It's nuts. We never, that's one story. But none of that with Charlie. Charlie was uh, totally laid back, sitting there, enjoying his drink, very quiet. And we just enjoyed the peace and quiet for a change of being with each other. We never really, never really talked about drums. We just talked about each other and what we were doing. 
just enjoying each other's company. That was a love, the lovely thing about Charlie. Charlie was a, a lovely, easy spoken, nice, relaxed guy to, to, to be with. And that reflects in his drumming. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Well said, Kenny. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Steve, do you want to, Steve Gad, do you want to maybe, uh, we'll sort of go around. I don't know if we're all looking at this the same way, but you're in my top left corner. <laughs> you're the secret square. So. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I'm Steve. I'm an alcoholic and drug addict. <laughs> <laughs> so am I. So am I. <laughs> hey, Kenny, did you and Charlie I used to talk about horses? And, and were you? did you ride together? No, we never rode together. And Charlie, I don't think, rode as well. But what we did do, I know his wife, Sherry, uh, she has about 70 horses. Uh, and they bred horses uh, and, their, and their daughter as well. So we had a lot in common because I I ride I used to ride well I don't ride anymore I'm fighting to fall off a broken arm. Right, I remember when I saw you when at the ginger thing. Yeah. That you told me you were they had polo ponies and and and. Uh, yeah. It was I I, I used to uh, have my grandparents and my uncle had horses when I was. A I kid. remember you telling me yeah. Yeah yeah yeah. Um, yeah I you know what I I I met Charlie with John. To Christopher and Yard, uh, we all went to see him. He was playing at a little club in Paris with these. It was with two keyboard players, and, and uh, it was like a boogie woogie kind of thing he was doing. Yeah. Right. And um, and you know it was great. And the thing that uh, the the thing that stuck out to me, uh, other than I mean the, the the band sounded great. And, and he was having a ball. But I mean, the bass player that was in the band was um, was somebody that uh, he uh, he grew up with. Charlie mm -hmm. grew up with this guy. And I, I remember, you know, hearing that story about how, how long they've been been playing together. And, um, you know, so and, and I knew um, from hearing about Charlie, that he was a, a family guy. He he loved uh, he loved his wife and his kids and his grandkids and and um, that, that's yeah, that's Charlie all over, huh? That's Charlie. That's Charlie. Yeah, yeah. That's and and you know what else killed me about him? He was elegant, man. The guy yeah. and he look. I loved the way he the way he dressed and the way he kept himself oh, and, magnificently. Uh, and 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 I and you know what I I, I love the Stones I, I love the band I, I never went to a Stones concert and I, it's not like I listened to all their albums but whenever I heard the band I, I loved it it sounded it was had a rawness about it and and when I think about how Charlie was in terms of uh, you know being soft spoken but also being true to himself in terms of, he was a bebopper, he, he loved jazz, he loved played the little kit. And, and uh, I, I think that, you know, in terms of being important in that band, that, that was a really important position. To, he was integral in that band, just by, by his, uh, his, the way he could hold things down, keep it down to earth and, and uh, and not sort of go off on a tangent. I, I think that was a big part of it. I, you know, I'm only surmising, but uh, you know, he's a great guy. I have a lot of respect for him. And um, and uh, Charlie, funny enough, Charlie used to say to me that um, the reason is uh, he got labeled for being so laid back, you know, behind the beat and all that was, uh, they kept him up till four in the morning. <laughs> so, so I'm not really tired to so get behind the beat. I can believe that. I can believe that. I've been there in that, in that position myself. Right. right, right. <laughs> That's funny. <clears throat> but well, yeah, uh, it was it was great to know him. Anyway, it was. Oh, it was, oh yeah, it's yeah. been a, pl a pleasure to be on this earth with him until he's yeah. there. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but like I said earlier, before I've been saying a lot a lot about in the presence of. You know, you, Charlie Watts is alive. He, his spirit will always be with us. Every time you listen to his playing, listen to him on a Stones record, you, you just think, lovely Charlie. Yeah. 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 
he had that ability to play the right thing at the right time. And well, there you go. You see, I mean, I don't want to get morbid about it, but you know, see, I like to keep the spirit of Charlie alive, you know, because he's that's what it's all about. You work all your life and do all that. And, and Charlie said, you know, what's it like being in the science? He said, yeah, great. He said, but he said, but it's uh, 25 years on the road and 25 years hanging about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great life. <laughs> you work uh, with Charlie Yard? Yeah. I uh, I got called in by Kenny's old pal, Bill Harrison. Oh, Bill, yeah. Yeah, and uh, when when uh, Bill was going out with Ray Cooper and Elton, if he was busy, he'd call me and say, would you look after Charlie with A, B, C, and D, a boogie woogie. And uh, it was an honour to do it. And when we met, it Bill. was great. You know, it was... It Bill was there he is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Up a bit, Kenny. <laughs> keep him alive, keep him alive. <laughs> and... Uh, so I'd go in because um, it was just great because we're both sarcastic and he's so laid back and chilled. I couldn't believe it. And uh, we, I remember meeting him at the airport at Heathrow to fly out to Austria and uh, I took his symbols off him and uh, off we went. And then when we, we got to the coffee bar, he said, uh, he said, watch the bags. He said, no, go and get the coffees. <laughs> 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 and off he did. And, uh, and he did it again in Austria. And he went off and he said, watch, watch the bags. I'll be back in a minute. Came back, laid the coffees down, and he bought me some strudel as well. <laughs> I would grab it every day in the hotel before we left for the gig. And uh, it was just so touching and it's just his sarcasm because when we got we got invited to dinner with with the mayor of this town who's the music promoter and he said tomorrow he said before you leave I'll take you up in the mountains and we'll have a traditional austrian meal no uh, no okay let me uh, rick, rick said that andy's not hearing us okay. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, unmute us. <laughs> unmute us. Okay. Come on, let's live up to our reputations. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> I'm going to have a crash course in editing when this is all done. for me. Yeah, oh, I've got to leave this in, John. This is yeah, John. Thing. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna spend an hour watching Andy in the background trying to figure out how to turn his computer on. <laughs> Oh man! I don't oh, need to edit this, John. All just right. broadcast it live. It's you know, terrible. when he gets it set up, you should just say, "And thanks for joining us." So we all hang up. Yeah, pay him off. And we're out. <laughs> first he's out. late. First he's and late. For joining us, and goodbye until next year. Right. <laughs> I don't nudge one another of us. Oh man! <laughs> oh man! Andy. <laughs> He, so he, 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 we're all muted. He can't hear us right now. No, yeah, I guess not. Okay, I've never he should have. Does anybody? Every... Does anybody know sign language? <laughs> Andy. Andy. <laughs> Hit the mute button. Good word, there we man. go. Okay, can you hear us now, Andy? <laughs> yes. No. You can't hear us. <laughs> oh fuck! All right, Andy, say something. <laughs> Oh, Andy, can you... oh, you know, send him a chat. No, he, we, he won't know how to turn that uh, on I, anyway. I did. I, I did. want you. <laughs> oh. He booted himself. Is it something I Andy, said? you marked left. He left the building. <laughs> oh, God. Oh. Oh. Uh, you know, he should have asked his grandkids how to do this. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, I do. He only has oh. cats. Oh, that's right. He only has cats. Where is he? Oh, He's gone. oh man. Oh, he well. booked a flight to, to, to Boston to go to John's house so that he could talk to us from there. Yeah, right. <laughs> Look, here he is. Uh, Andy, oh, where is he now? How many drummers does it take to do a Zoom call? Exactly. Yeah. Apparently, ten. <laughs> nine, anyway. Uh, well, I, I was going to, uh, Steve Maxwell, I, I know you have 
probably a lot of stories from working with Charlie and and uh, and you you archived his collection. Yeah, about ten years ago. Oh man, two thousand seven. Oh, wow. uh, you know, Charlie is the neatest guy on the face of the earth, right? Except when you went over to where all the drums were when I flew over there, it was nothing but a massive pile of cardboard boxes. There were about three hundred cardboard boxes, no rhyme or reason to anything. It was really? wild and crazy. Um, I spent two weeks over there cataloging everything. And I told a couple of little stories like this in my uh, tribute to him. But one of the great, there are two cool ones. And, and then there's a little bit about his kindness and everything that I, that I really do want to touch on, because that's more important to me, actually, than even the great drumming contributions he made. Uh, uh oh. Uh oh. But, <laughs> but go ahead, Steve. Yeah. Continue. No, no, right. Keep going. So, one of the things went over there and he said, I was looking at his drums and he, he said, you know, uh, I said, Charlie, whatever happened to the first kit that you had, the, the Ludwig Sky Blue Pearl kit that you had before you had the Gretsch kits? He says, oh, well, you know, I gave that to somebody and it's gone and somebody did something with it. I don't know. So I was crawling around the floor over there and I, I see a bunch of boxes and scribbled on the box says my first drum set. And I pull it out, open it. It's the Sky Blue Pearl Ludwig kit. So I picked wow. up the phone. I called him. And I said, Charlie, it's here. Come over. So we got somebody to bring him over. And he goes, oh, my God, oh, my God. And I, he said, me dad bought that for me on higher credit. So it was wow. kind of like, you know, and so it's like, that's so cool. And I, I put it in a special place over there. I said, you know, everybody take care of it. But then one other time I, I, I was doing it, and he, he called me. And he said, did you find, uh, I, you need to find a little box. And I, I said, well, uh, what is it? He said, no, we, did you find this box? And I don't understand what he's talking about. It, he said, it's about the size of a, like a suitcase. I said, well, no, because your personal stuff is over in one place and this is your drums and you know, I'm not touching your personal stuff. So we got to find it, we got to find it. I said, I said, what's the big deal? So we're over there and we look around, we find this box, this little box, about the size of a suitcase. We open it up, he says, this is it. It's a, it's a, so I open the box and it's a bunch of these things like you'd buy it maybe in the thirties or the forties it's a little thing of percussion, goofy stuff, a little set of little, you know, finger symbols, a little goofy, bunch of little weird stuff. He said, I used this with Keith when we recorded the demo on cassette for Street Fighting Man. Oh, mm -hmm. right. right. Yeah. yeah. I said, okay, now I get it. I mean, it's like, why yeah. am I looking for a suitcase? We're, we're trying to catalog the drums, but that was so important to him. You wanted that. So we put it in a special place with a little sign on it. But, um, the, the, the things for me, I mean, one other thing, he bought a bunch of stuff from me and he was on tour and he said, well, you don't have to worry about when you ship it because I won't see it for a year or so. I said, well, that's kind of crazy. So before I went to the show, I made a nice album of photographs of all of those things. So at least he could take it with him and say, hey, you know, here's what I just got. So I bring it to the show. I show him the album and he looks through it. I said, these are all the things that you just got. He said, oh, that's very nice. And he hands me back the album. And I said, no, man, it's for you, you know, so you got something to look at. So, I mean, he, and, and the other two things, I mean, it's just the most important things to me, uh, his generosity, the stuff he did for Joe Morello, uh, it was incredible. Uh, you know, Joe and his wife, Jean, were not in, you know, good circumstances at all financially. And um, I had gotten to the point where I, I worked on Joe getting his kit back from Brubeck and... Uh, frozen. 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 <coughs> Brubeck uh -oh. heard this and he stopped and uh -oh. cut him off. <laughs> Are you frozen? Uh oh. Steve, you're. you're... At, at, here. I... So what, uh, and it was like changing <laughs> money for you. I think Charlie is probably fucking this up, you know. He's <laughs> having, I think you're he's playing having, uh, Michael. Yeah, he is. He's he's having the last laugh. Enough, Sean, enough. Did you do any preparation for this at all? Of course I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Steve's back. Steve Maxwell is back. Okay, oh. Steve, we lost you for a minute. Lost oh. you around Joe. Oh. <clears throat> Joe Morello. Oh, Joe oh, Morello and his and his wife. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Charlie. Charlie bought the Brubeck era kit. He brought the bought the Peisty symbols from that same era. Wow. Uh, so uh, Joe's chrome over brass snare that he used with Marion McPartland. He just 
wanted those things to contribute and it was life-changing money for Joe and Jean. And, and you know, that, that's a side of, of, of the rock star image that a lot of people don't see. Charlie was such a kind, wonderful guy. He's unbelievable, yeah. unassuming, just like all of us uh, have just said. Uh, it, it was a, rare qualities, rare qualities. And uh, just, uh, I'll miss him a lot, man. He was a, he was a great guy. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I'll just, you know, talking about Joe Morello, this is, this has become public. I know in the last, since, since Charlie's passing. Oh, and yeah. I think he didn't want people to know that um, his drumstick that Vic Firth makes mm -hmm. was a copy of the Joe Morello 11A Ludwig stick. So his royalties were sent to Joe all those years wow. for, that, for that drumstick. And yep. oh, wow. yep. my wow. wife, yeah, my wife, who's Vic Firth's daughter told me this many years ago. And she said, you know, it's probably not something that, you know, Charlie wants people to know about, but, um, but it's, and that's, it's I think public. that where I cut out, that was what I was talking about as well, yeah. because yeah, he, uh, I mean, that was amazing. I was yeah. just amazingly kind and generous and just a wonderful person. Yeah. That's why everyone loved him. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. He was so unassuming down to earth that he made everyone feel comfortable around him. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, it was one of the, my greatest moments was to get to work with him. Yeah. because of how he was because i you know there's loads loads of drummers i really admire and grown up with and, uh, <coughs> but it's their humility and kindness to people yeah i like you know you kind of lock in with them and think yeah mm. not only a great drummer but a great guy too yeah. and, and it's not just being a, a super beautiful human being uh you know, who's famous, it, that, it wouldn't matter if he was famous or a man of wealth and taste like he is. As a general human being, he was more excellent than most, most of us, yeah. you know, <laughs> in his kindness. Yeah, yeah. 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 But my, my touching moments are really simple. It's like you're in a hotel and you're waiting to check out and Charlie carries his own bags down the stairs. You know, no fuss, immaculately dressed in his three-piece suit, yeah. you know, tie on everything. And, and when we stopped at service stations, he would just get out and go and buy something from the shop. And his great friend, Dave Green, who played bass in the band, um, they've been friends for 75 years, you know, wow. living next door to each other from the age of five, became friends. And both have had successful careers in music. And, um, and Dave, is, Dave and Charlie are two peas in a pod, same temperament, just real nice people. And you can see why they were friends all those years. I got a funny, I got a couple of things, but one of them is um, I was in the studio once when the Stones were recording, hanging out and um, sitting on the couch. And I, but I, they're doing the track and I noticed Charlie, every time he hits the snare drum, like all this something, all this stuff would fly up. I'm, I'm thinking... What is that? They got done and he came and sat in the couch next to me. I said, Charlie, what's that stuff flying up off the snare drum? Hmm. He said, oh, that's the snare drum I used at the Hyde Park concert for, um, for Brian. And that's confetti that was flying around. And that was like 30 years ago. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was still on the drum. <laughs> uh, that's classic. Yeah. 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 Oh man, I got one more that's really kind of yeah, sweet. Absolutely. Um, that um, you know everybody knows about Charlie's love for jazz, and uh, he he had been invited by Jack D. Jeanette to come down and see uh, Keith Jarrett and Jack, and um, uh, at, I think at the Vanguard or so, you know somewhere downtown, I forget, but he wasn't in town, so he called Mick, and he said. Mick, call Michael Shreve and go down to the club so you can tell Jack that I said hello and that I want I want somebody to represent. So Mick, Mick came over the house. We went down and we watched the show because Jack had asked Mick to do it. Mick had a great time too. That's great. That's great. <clears throat> I, I, you know, speaking of his his love for all the jazz legend legends in 2012, I remember the year because it was at the end of my time at Zildjian. They were having their um, um, premiere of of um, 
not Shine a Light, but the movie they did after Crossfire Hurricane. They were doing the premiere in New York City. Steve Maxwell, I don't know if you were around for that or not, but I was there and I was, yes, there. yes, I yeah. remember that. Yes. I, I, I came to, I actually came right from London, Andy. I'd had dinner with you and a bunch of people um, while I was there, while Kelly and I were there. And then we went to New York for the premiere. But um, he asked me if I could wait out front for Roy Haynes to make sure that Roy got in okay. Because, you know, he said, I, I've, I've got to go now, but, I, you know, I can, can you, like, he, he, it was very important that Roy get brought inside and, and get comfortable. So I brought Roy in, I sat him down uh, in a nice spot up on the second floor of like the sort of mezzanine area. And I got a text or a call from Anton Fig, who was downstairs. And I think, I guess I must've had his pass. So I ran down and got Anton. And as we came up, Charlie was there talking to Roy and, and, uh, you know, and, and, and he was he was so happy and like relieved that Roy was there and 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 comfortable. You know, it was it was beautiful. I mean, he uh, he was always doing stuff like that. I know he used to send a limo for Roy to. to yeah. Uh, yeah. Roy lived in Long Island. Yeah. To come. Oh, John, I've got a Roy, a real quick Roy story. Uh, remember when uh, ABC and Dia Boogie Woogie did that week at the Iridium? Yeah. Uh, 2012, I think it was. And I. I was with Charlie that whole week. I had you know, I let him use my drums and everything. And then uh, one night Roy came and I, I said, I said to Charlie, I said, you know, Roy's here. He said, bloody hell, I'm going to have to play better tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. but, but he was thrilled for it to have Roy there. It really meant a lot to him. It was, yeah, I spoke, was to, uh, I spoke to Gra Graham Haynes a couple of weeks ago and he mentioned Roy's son <laughs> and he said that every time yeah. The Stones played or Charlie played. He would send a limo and make sure that Charlie was well taken. I mean, that Roy was well taken care of. They must have had great discussions about clothing, too, huh? <laughs> Probably, yeah. yeah I would, I would oh, yeah, I'll bet. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you in 2004, Andy and Peter Erskine and Steve White and Mark Mondesere and, and myself and the two folks that worked at Zildjian in the UK, Tina and Bob, went to see Charlie at Ronnie Scott's. And uh, and he was he was nervous that that Peter Erskine was in the audience. You know, he was he, <laughs> and he said to me uh, something like, you know, why? Why do you have to bring these people to see me or something? You know, like, it's fine if you come by yourself. And then six years later, Steve and I, as he was saying in the story, we were in Paris with in Yard uh, on the mission from Gad tour. And we went to see him with the ABCD of Boogie Woogie and at a club in Paris. And he and he said, I remember that night he said something like, you know, you're, you're, you know, he was definitely like, you're always, why do you have to bring these people to see me? Like, uh, <laughs> he, but he was so humble like that. And that picture that I showed of, of Yard and Steve and me and everybody and Charlie, I, my wife took that picture and, and I remember him saying this, he, he turned to you, Steve, and he said, he's always, he's always doing promos, this guy, he's always, it's always got to be about, I mean, you know, it was his way of busting my balls, which was hilarious, like, <laughs> yeah, so let's, let's get a picture, let's just, let's get a picture, and he's like, oh, really, a picture, you know, this, <laughs> this, you know, John, when we talk about his, his ability to, and his love of jazz, th there was something that I think is uh, kind of meaningful, I, at one point, uh, I had talked to him, I said, Charlie, why don't we do a book, about the jazz drummers that you love because you bought stuff from me that, is, that was from all these different players. And so one time I was over there and I still have the tapes of this. We never finished it, but we actually sat in his, in his flat in South Kensington there and talked for three hours and I've got it all on tape. And one of these days I'd, I'd love to, I don't want any money for it, but I'd love to make it into something as a, as a, a history because he talked if you walked in there, first of all, you could see pictures on the wall all over the place of Charlie Parker, you know, uh, Ellington, Basie, you name it, all of the people that he loved. And we sat in his kitchen there and sipped espresso. What char was charming about it was out of little chipped es espresso cups. It didn't matter. Just we sat there and for three hours. He talked about every one of these people and what they meant to him. Joe Morello, Buddy, Davey Tuff, Big Sid Catlett. Louis Belson, all of these people, and then the other musicians in and around that area. It wasn't just that he was, he was like an encyclopedia of jazz musicians, period, not just jazz drummers. 
And it was just wonderful to sit there and have that. And like I say, I've still got the tapes and that's something I think somewhere along the line should be made available. I'd love to do that. Boy. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, why don't yeah. you just yeah. uh, get it transcribed and edited yeah. Yeah. and um, John will put it out. Well, I, I just don't want to do anything like that without, you know, without uh, Shirley or somebody saying it's okay to do it. I don't, I just want it to be there. You know what I mean? Yeah. I yeah. want people to get a chance to, to hear that. Yeah. But I've got it now and I'll, I'll try to work on that because that I think would be important. Great. Yeah. He was such yeah. knowledge. I mean, he just knew so much. He'd talk about Bill Evans. He'd talk about Ellington. He'd talk about Basie. He'd talk about Charlie Parker. And then other drummers. Stan Levy he was a great drummer in that same era. Dizzy. Just it went on and on and on. It was incredible. It's jazz education for me. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I That's agree. a great pick there. What year is that, John? That picture with Stan and Charlie. Is that 89, Stan, or 90? 88, 89, yeah. Must be. I mean, steel wheels, yeah. maybe. Steel wheels. Oh yeah, yeah. steel wheels. Yeah. I see that. Yeah. L.A. So, Coliseum. L.A. Coliseum. Or yes. yeah, yeah. I, uh, that was the first time I saw them. And then fast forward to 2019 in Phoenix, we flew out there because it was a smaller market. We got to see Charlie. That was the last time we saw them play. But that I remember this event. They had uh, two openers. It was Living Color, and then. Uh, Guns and Roses and Axel Rose sort of fell off the front of the stage. He was acting up. But then the opening song was Start Me Up and they came out and it had this explosion as soon as Charlie hit that back, first backbeat and it was just electrifying from there on out. So incredible chance to hang out with him after that several times, mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of all over the world. Um, three real memorable ones were uh, Nampa, Idaho, small market place. So I brought my... Uh, daughter was in the fifth grade because she wanted to you know see them there and uh, it was a 12,000 seat hall it was really fun she got to meet them they used to do that little thing where they rehearse the insert songs or the voted songs yeah. in the rehearsal yeah. room so each one of them came over and got to meet her and take a picture with her so she, you know Charlie once again is so accommodating on any situation and then uh, same thing at Hyde Park they were played the you know most recent one and on that exhibitionism term, the, the, uh, the exhibit there, so that blue, the, uh, Steve Maxwell was talking about the blue Ludwig kit that was at that exhibition. You got to see it right close. That was really cool. And, you know, just shout out to Don McCauley and Pierre de Beauport. Those are my buddies that, you know, have kept me in the loop with the whole Charlie Watts thing. And, you know, it's lifelong impact for, for me to, to have a, a, the chance to hang out with him several times. Yeah, <clears throat> fantastic. Yeah, I seeing him in, and I saw him in Buffalo and some other smaller markets, and and those were always the the best shows because, you know, it was it, there was more access, I guess you could say, if, if nothing else. Like right. he was, you know, it, there were fewer sort of layers of people to get through to just spend time with him, and um, yeah, very memorable visits, and yeah. We've all got great things to say about Charlie. Oh, it's lovely to listen to everybody. And they're yeah. wonderful stories. Oh, yeah, thanks, yeah. Kenny. I'm afraid I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to leave you now, guys. Mm. Before uh, I go, can yeah. I make a toast to Charlie? Yes, great Cheers. idea. To Charlie. Charlie. Cheers. Cheers. To Charlie. Yeah. Cheers. And, and to you guys, and well done, everyone. You've got lovely you, things to say about him. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. We Still really so. appreciate it. Yeah. Keep up yep. and we'll see you soon. I'm sorry to leave you. No, it's it's all right. Thank you for joining. Where's Steve Maxwell gone? I'm here. <laughs> oh, he's he's still there. Yep. I'm still here. Remember when you came over to log Charlie's stuff, and I came down to the warehouse. Yes. And because uh, we every time we went out, I used to pick his symbols up, and his Keith Moon stick bag. Yep. And uh, his pedals. Two. We take two Speed Kings with us. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember being in the warehouse with him and he's looking up at the shelves and he said to me, he said, I could do with some plain drum bags for everything. So I called a friend of mine who's a well-known, renowned drum bag maker. <laughs> <laughs> he was a huge Stones fan. And I said, I've got a great little gig for you. And I told him, I said, 
we want the bags, but we don't want the logo. We just want a plain black bag. And he said, I can't. <laughs> I'm thinking, who's going to know? Who's going to know? Nobody's going to know, right? They're going to be in the warehouse, you know? Yeah, exactly. So just do it, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's things people call me, and I think, why not? Let's do it, you know? But he just I, he said, I can't let it go out. And I just thought, <laughs> you're Come a man. you got to be crazy. It's in the warehouse. Only like six people can get in there. It's like, yeah. that's it. <laughs> he, he, he wouldn't do it, and I was just showing like Fort Knox. It's lucky it's yeah, not me. Exactly. Oh, those bags would be up there Monday morning. But uh, no, the good thing about that was I was in the warehouse, and 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 then I was talking to Charlie when we we're out, and we we're talking about his collection, and uh, he said a great thing. He said they shouldn't be in bags on the shelves; they should be played. Yeah. You know. And, and that right. was a great comment. Yeah. He and I had talked once, Yard, about actually doing a museum where those would all be on display, yeah. interactive with, oh, this was Buddy's kit, and this, here's somebody, Louis Belson. He's got yeah. Kenny Clark's premiere kit that I sent him, Sonny yeah. Greer's leading yeah. kit from Ellington, all of these things that, oh. that I, I, oh. I sent, that he got from me. The, yeah, the yeah. collection is unbelievable. He's got Tony Williams' Istanbul case that I got him. He's got Joe Morello's <laughs> Brubeck era kit. Yeah. It's it's he's got one of Belson's kits. These are all things that he got from me, and they're they're like a history of of jazz drummers. It's incredible. Uh, the only five by fourteen Billy Gladstone snare drum in existence. He's got the white marine pearl <laughs> Billy Gladstone kit that was made for Benny Goodman with Cozy Cole's snare drum that was <laughs> owned by different people: Bunny Carlos, then Carl Palmer, and I brokered it from Carl to Charlie. Mm. I mean, this stuff is. Yeah. It's, it's the history of jazz drumming. It's unbelievable. Uh, Big Sid Catlett symbols. Yeah. Wow. What's the, the uh, what's the, Steve, what's the, the uh, Pisces symbol from, um, from Brubeck that Joe Morello had? Uh, he had, so they were uh, hi-hats, crashes, and his ride. It was a full set of Pisces. What's the ride? What is it? It was a 20, Six. 602. 602. They were all six up twos. Yeah. Supposedly he used an A Zildjian on take five. I, I've I've heard that that it was not a six oh two. That it, I always assumed it was, but I I think I'd heard it was before he went to Peisty. He it, was playing A Zildjian. Yeah. And I have the I have, I, well I have the fourteen inch hats that he used on take five, and those were uh, A's. Those were A's as well. Yeah. <laughs> I I always assumed there were six oh twos, but I think it was just ahead he made that recording just ahead of that time but just a quick yeah. funny so charlie visited zildjian one time only in 2006 and it, I, th I think steve it was probably around the time you're talking when he was accumulating all these kits talking yes. about yep. he told me he was going to he, he was going to do a coffee table book um, yeah fo photograph all the kits and yep. we had a bunch <laughs> of pictures on our wall that he was so excited. In fact, his main reason for coming that day was to look at all the pictures. I'd been telling him for years, you won't believe, you know, the pictures that we have going back to the 30s. And so he, we walked along and he, he asked for copies of certain ones because in those, some of these pictures were the drum kits that he got from you. That's so right. He, and the yeah. concept for the book was going to be one of, it's a coffee table book. On this page, on the left page, here's a beautiful picture of the set. On the right page, it's split in two. Here's Charlie's recollection of why it was important to him to have a Joe Morello's drum set. And the bottom half of it was going to be how the set came to me and eventually got to Charlie. I mean, he's also got uh, Mel Lewis's yeah. 121420 Burgundy Sparkle Kit. At wow. one point, and what you said, Yard, about those things should be played. At one point, I was there and Charlie came over and I said, Charlie, come on. And I set up two drum sets. I set up Mel Lewis's kit and I set up one other kit. And I said, here play it because he'd never had a chance to play any of these. I said, here, sit down and play, have fun. <laughs> and it was, it, it was remarkable, but yes. Yeah. Those things, I, I'd love to see those things displayed somewhere. I, I don't know what, well, I don't know. I mean, it, it was so important to him to collect these pieces of the drummers that meant so much to him, his idols, the people that inspired him. So I, I hope something, um, something gets done with that to kind of, memorialize that forever you know that would be great yeah yeah Can I, I just i want to tell one quick what i think is kind of a funny story uh, the last time i saw him two years ago 2019 on tour 
I had just bought this Rogers uh, kit. It's not, it's in the other room. It's not in, in view here, but it's a mid sixties holiday kit, 13, 16, 22. In fact, I was inspired by the kit that you sold Peter Erskine, Steve Maxwell to, yes, yes. to get a Rogers. And Peter's oh, telling man, me, yeah. you got to get, you, these drums are amazing. So I, I found one from a guy locally, beautiful uh, black diamond pearl kit that Rick Murata is rolling his eyes about right now because <laughs> I made Rick look at it. But um, so I, I'm excited. I just got the kit a month or two before that. I think I'd sent pictures to you, Stan, when I got these drums. And so I'm telling Charlie about them. And, um, and I said, do you have any Rogers, any Rogers drums in your collection? All excited. He said, well, yes, actually, I have Louis Belson's kit that he play, used for skin yeah. beef. <laughs> So and I, went, I went, of course you do, you know, like <laughs> I'm thinking like I have a drum, I have, you know, some drums that Charlie doesn't have. He goes, well, I've, I've got Louie's kit that he used on skin deep. Yeah. He got, he got a kit of Louie's from me and he got a kit of buddies from me, buddies Rogers kit that he used with Harry James. Mm. Yeah. They got, you gotta do a, you gotta do a show with, you gotta do a show like a PAS or somebody to like put all these kits out and yeah, you know, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd love to hear from these, these three quiet men here, Stan and Rick and Andy, that um, <laughs> maybe they're, they're so Andy, can I just tell a quick funny story about when we saw him, you and me and Peter and, and the gang in 2004, right? I think about six months later, you did a gig with Ronnie or sometime not long after that, you did a gig with Ronnie Wood. <laughs> And I happened yeah. to talk. Yeah, I happened to talk to Charlie on the phone, and and um, he said, uh, "I I saw your friend playing with Ronnie, and and he he didn't remember your name right away, but but he referred to you as that really good American <clears throat> drummer." And I and he said, "You know, you you he, he came to you brought him with you to see me or something." And I said, "Oh, Andy, Andy Newmark." He said, "Andy, that's it, Andy." So anyway, so and you were the really good American drummer. Well, that's nice. I'll take a compliment wherever I can get it. You know, me too. Yeah, he never called me that. I know that. <laughs> An American now living in England. An yeah. American in London. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. As exactly. opposed to an American in Paris. Yeah. Or an Englishman in New York. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, I didn't know Charlie, but. I do love the Rolling Stones music, and I always have. They're, um, I always thought, I mean, I never had the records. I, I, I never had anybody's records. I never collected records in my life. But I knew all their tunes, and uh, I always thought they were a soulful bunch of cats. And, uh, man, I mean, yeah, I mean, how do you say that? thing uh they were much greater than the sum of their individual parts absolutely yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly you know what's yeah. really fascinating about charlie or interesting at least is the power of that band and we all know is unbelievable if you go to a concert one of the songs itself i just looked at the set list from uh, pittsburgh from the other night right and it's unbelievable the catalog of songs of course but it's so powerful. And when you look at Charlie play, he's not bashing the drums whatsoever. Yeah. You know, whereas you think the, the heavy rock drummers, they're like, <laughs> you know, and Char <laughs> Charlie's just playing there, but it sounds huge. Well, yeah, that's a lesson it took me a while to learn. Let the microphones do the work. Yeah. <laughs> because if you try to play too hard, so much uh, important shit goes out the window once you start trying to play with too much volume. But just on that point, I saw Led Zeppelin before John Bonham died in Germany. Mm. And I was on the side of the stage. And, I, you know, they're considered like the godfathers of metal, heavy metal. And I stood on the side of the stage and couldn't believe how quietly they were all playing. Oh, it was wow. loud as shit coming out of the house PA. It was overwhelming. But on the side of the stage where I was, 
John Bonham was not even breaking a sweat. I mean, they wow. were, he was playing at a very, very relaxed volume. And that's what I remember from the concert mm -hmm. that these guys, though they are known for the, the heavy metal vibe, it's like when you hear them up close, they're just four guys who like really acknowledge the space and the dynamics. And it's the house PA that is making that shit be enormous. Yeah. But um, yeah, Charlie, Charlie played very gentle. Yeah. Very yeah. gentle. Yeah. You know, when I saw him with Peter and, uh, and John that night at Ronnie Scott's, it was incredibly unsensational like in a way that Charlie is so unsensational in the eyes of some, but so beautiful in the eyes of others. And, you know, like, I mean, even in the Rolling Stones, I mean, Charlie plays the odd little fill, maybe every 16 bars. Uh, but in this thing with his big band, my recollection is that Charlie never played a single fill through the entire set wow. and that was pretty amazing in modesty mm -hmm. and also um well it was typical of charlie he played less with the big band than he does with the rolling stones <laughs> i really mean this i'm yeah. not exaggerating yeah, yeah. he didn't play a single fill his right hand never came off the ride symbol yeah wow. and the the modesty the modesty of it all mm -hmm. was actually overwhelming and peter erskine looked at me afterwards and said and now you got to remember peter erskine is like true at his core he's a jazz motherfucker okay right, right? he can play anything he's an all-rounder but at his core He's a jazz cat, old school. He's played in big bands, all that stuff. You know, Peter has that shit covered. So you got to understand, Peter is looking at this as a guy who knows the big band genre. Whereas I'm a rock and roll rhythm and blues guy. I know nothing about that music. So I'm just taking it in from a different angle. But Peter knows that entire history of music. And when it was over, he leaned over to me and he said, now, you have to understand, he didn't mean this in any kind of negative way, all right? Because this is all about love for Charlie. But I just want to tell you, since you want a story, <laughs> Peter leaned over to me and he said, look, man, I, I don't know how to say this. He said, but I'm going to say it quietly. He says, I'm not sure if I get this. <laughs> get it? <Wow. laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I said, look, I understand, and by the way, Peter inevitably is going to hear this, so I got to make sure I cover all my bases here to make sure that no one sees you Peter. Threw him under the bus, and the bus already ran him over. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just say, I said to Peter, "Listen, man, I, I understand what you are experiencing. I said, here's how you need to take this in." This is about honesty. That's what Charlie's about. And you can say that about any player, whether they're a minimalist or whether they play a million notes every bar. You can give everybody that, that sort of <coughs> label and go, hey, that's what the cat feels. It's honesty. And you have to understand that this is who Charlie is, Peter. You know, and if you check the Rolling Stones out, you'll see what I mean. But it's simply about honesty. And that's how Charlie feels this music and wishes to honor it. And there's no fireworks. So get over it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to make sure nobody here <laughs> sees Peter in a bad light for saying he didn't no. quite get it. No, not at all. I, I understand that. I yeah. understand that. Yep. 
But I just said, well, I told him what I said. But anyhow, I remember that very distinctly because, uh, yeah, it is what it is. You know, I, I suppose a way to look at it is that Charlie had such a such a love for this music and an admiration and respect for the players that he, he he wanted to put himself in that environment. You know, uh, it's, totally. like, it's like walking in a room of all your heroes and you just, you know, you, you're sitting in the driver's seat, but you don't have anything to prove. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. listen, I, I didn't, there's something I should add that all night for the whole hour, the music felt great. I, I didn't include that. Yeah. It all yeah. was swinging and I'm not, you know, familiar with that genre. I, I, I didn't tune in until like Chuck Berry. So I know nothing about that music, but it felt really good. It was grooving. And I mean, that's something in itself. He made it all feel good. I just want to add it that yeah. though it may yeah. be unsensational in terms of fireworks. It was sensational in terms of groove and you know, that's what he does for the Rolling Stones. Yeah, Even true. though the shit can be slightly all over the place at times, the Stones always, it always feels good. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's metronomic. And I know I've banged on for, you know, many years about getting your shit together and playing in time and click tracks. And, you know, you got to learn to get that stuff together. But I mean, the bottom line is, contrary to everything I've said in the past, you know, music can feel good no matter what. Yeah. And the Stones were like, you know, they were all over the place a lot of the time, but it it always felt good. You could tap your foot to it and dance to it. You know what they meant, you know, and, and that's what Charlie brought to it. I mean, it, at least in spite of all the, all sometimes being all over the place, Charlie, held it together and he did the same thing with the big band he provided yeah, he a groove he did. and let the horn section just do their shit yeah it steve was, it was did you ever band. hear that band steve gad did you hear that the, the, did, uh, the did Stones? you hear Char yeah charlie with Char the big band yeah no, it was a no, tentet, I, I think it was no, yeah i didn't hear that no yeah, I, I had seen them in 2001, the same band at the Blue Note in New York. I believe it was the same band we saw Andy in 2004. So I was I was maybe less surprised, I guess, when we saw him at Ronnie's because I, I had I had that sort of eye opening the first time I saw him in 2001, where Charlie just he just played time all night. And, and my takeaway from that was that he really didn't want to make this about him at all. He didn't you know, people were coming to see him obviously he was the, the draw to get people to come see the band for the most part but he and you're right no in terms of fireworks it wasn't about that and he just really wanted to stay out of the way and and i think in my mind once i got past that and you know sort of mentally i really dug it because he's like you said it really grooved it swung the, the rest of the guys in the band were great played great and it was really musical it didn't it didn't need his it didn't need him you know throwing shit down to make it better you know um yeah i mean big band drumming became an art form and we know like there's a lot of guys like mentioned today buddy rich louis belson cozy cole they were like really exciting like yeah. goosebumps big band drummers so there is that side of it yeah. where big band drumming can be incredibly exciting and and most cats that play in a big band will tell you if the drummer ain't happening the whole thing is not happening but charlie came at it from a different point of view there were not you know he just played the time like that's what he does i mean mm -hmm. that's all that's what charlie does he there was no attempt at any kind of big band uh vocabulary at all he grooved through the whole thing you know, we've been one of his heroes was Davy Tuff. Davey in Tuff, that, I was thinking Davey that. Yeah. Tuff 
was just a straight ahead timekeeping guy who couldn't do a double stroke press roll. It saved his life, but he, he locked it in. It's that, you know, it's that kind of thing, the Davy tough thing. And also a little bit maybe of the Mel Lewis side and, and guys like Don Lamont, you know, who Buddy Rich said, Don Lamont's the greatest big band drummer in the world. That was Buddy who said that because I, there's and a I'm, side of it, you know, where I, you just, you locked it in and you, and it swings like a son of a bitch and you don't <laughs> need to do the pyrotechnics, you know? I, yeah. ju I read a biography on Don Lamont. I'd never even knew about the guy and then checked out some recordings. And uh, let me tell you, he could deliver the fireworks as oh, yeah. well. He if was he needed monster. to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And this other guy somebody mentioned earlier, Stan Levy, never yeah. heard of the cat in my life. Mm. But I got a book, a book about Stan Levy that somebody sent me a few months ago. That was an education that was. I mean, he was deep into it right back when all the bebop stuff was Charlie happening. Parker and Dizzy Gillespie, man. He was in their band and he kicked serious ass. And what a technician, too, man. Stan was a killer. And so you know Stan too. Levy? was a boxer, a yes. semi-professional boxer. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Anyhow, they, they had a photograph of him and Charlie in the back of the book. I mean, this was all new to me. I, I never had heard of Stan Levy, so it was all fascinating, but somebody mentioned him earlier. Cool. But yeah. um, wow, he was a part of some very happening stuff, but yet Charlie dug deep into all these cats. Oh yeah. Well, I'd, I'd love to hear from Stan and Rick on like some memorable Charlie recordings or songs that maybe even influenced you. I think Stan yeah. wants to say, I see Stan has been trying to get a word in for the last 15 minutes, but. <laughs> I, I was just going to respond to the, to, to my impression of watching Charlie and listening that uh, he seemed like a, the ultimate conversationalist in a band and being in a band is so different than just being a, a drummer. It's um, it requires it's a it's a magical moment like you know the Stones without Charlie it, it's dead meat it's like Zepp without Bonzo or like the Faces without Kenny or etc cetera, etc cetera. it's that wonderful intangible thing where usually it requires the drummer you know that old story about he's got two ears and he's going to listen twice as hard with you know, he's got one mouth two ears listen listen more than you talk and. Charlie's the full embodiment of that to me coming up when you're coming up listening, you think, oh, I got to learn to be flash. I'm going to show my ass. I'm going to, I'm going to be the man. Then you see a guy like Charlie walk out and you realize he's responding. He's way, he's, he's listening intently. And then he's going to react if, if needed, or maybe he parries by non-reaction. Maybe he's the ultimate swordsman. He's like, Hey, knock yourselves out. And it just, and I love watching him do that. Like watching his band, he would, he would watch them so carefully, but yet not like uptight about it. He was just, I'll let you guys do your thing. I'll let, and you'll, and, but it was magical. The records that he made. And when I started to really listen, like Andy was saying about that, that volume thing, like you hear a song, like, like even Ruby Tuesday, or she's a rainbow or one of those, they're sort of like, Otter songs, and you realize that the massive, it sounds like he's coming at you with baseball bats, but then you realize it's that beautiful technique. He's pulling the sound out. He's, he's mm -hmm. reaching in and bringing it out. Like that's, he's not dead sticking anything. And it's just gorgeous to watch that relaxed power and dignity. And it, it was fabulous just to see, he, boy, he was the right guy in that band. And you know, I know Steve Jordan is a, is a monster, it's going to always kill me to see someone in that chair. It'll never, it's going to hurt. It probably hurts Steve Jordan too. I know yeah. it does. Yeah. You know, it's like, it hurts like hell. You know, just the thought like, you know, not seeing that beautiful kid, not seeing that cool dude. He, I know. He, Let me ask you something. Can, uh, uh, Stan, well, anybody who cares to comment, I have a question. Do you, think that it's wrong or somehow does it disagree with you hmm. that Led Zeppelin, well, Led Zeppelin never went out again without John Bonham, but the fact that The Who went out without Keith and the Stones are going without Charlie and I can't think of any other examples, but does that bug you? 
Does that bug any of you? You, you, I can weigh in. I, I can see, like I, I, I can see it at both sides now. As an, as an earlier, as a young buck, I'd go like, you know, man, you got to hang it up, man. You can't do that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But as I've gotten older, my rule book is becoming more blended. Mm -hmm. And I can see that like everybody's got to be somewhere, man. And it's as long as you can do it. And I know in this situation with the stones, if there was ever a reverent motherfucker, that's going to be Steve Jordan. He's going to mm -hmm. honor those charts. I swear to God, he's going to know those songs, the records better than the band well. Yeah. And they're probably mm -hmm. going to have to stress him to make him realize like, no, man, we that was 30 years ago. we did Because <laughs> he's going to be so honorable. And, you know, and but I agree. There's, yeah. it's, it's tough. I, I mean, part of me, like when, yeah, when, when, when Moon died, I was like outraged. But then when I saw it, it was like, well, it's Kenny Jones. Well, shit. Mm -hmm. That, let me tell you, cool. let me weigh in a, a minute about the Jordan thing, if I can, yeah. uh, because I think it's important. I think, you know, what, what everybody's saying here is right. Um, I think if the band wants to go <laughs> with Charlie's Blessing, no less, because that that yeah. was discussed in advance. And Steve called me before uh, and this was announced and he said, hey, man, I need your help because we got to I need something. And he needed some drums. And he told me what was going to be happening. He was going to be on the tour. And we were trying to, we were talking about what he wanted. And he said, what I really want, and, and we got, we arranged for all of this for him equipment wise. He said, I just really want to make sure that I do justice to the sound of, of each of the songs, the eras, etc. Everything I want to do justice to it. We talked about a bunch of different types of kits that he might use. Um, we ended up getting, getting a 10 piece Gretsch kit. He finally nailed it down. He said, the 13 and the 14 floor and the 24 bass drum are the ones that are doing it. He's got a wood snare drum that we got him. He said, uh, 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 it's a separate issue. It's a Craviato wood snare he's playing. But he said, you know, for certain tunes, I need the metal drum he's playing. And he's really dialing it into what am I here for? I am here to best represent the band and the music. And it's not about him. So mm -hmm. I do believe it was the best possible choice. And he already has the... Uh, the vibe going because of all the work he's done with Keith. So that's helpful right. too. But yeah, I yeah. do think he's the perfect choice. Nothing replaces, no, it's not a replacement. It's just, uh, it, it's not a replacement, <clears throat> but it's the best choice to let them continue. That's what I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. He was the only choice. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, yeah. He was the yes. only, only, only choice. Yeah. 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 Right. I, don't, I don't think Keith would have anybody else. <laughs> No. No. Donnie yeah. D's got his hands up. He's all what about him. The, the thing is, the thing is with Jordan, I I did I did a Claxon tour with Steve, and I used to I watched one tour where he, he had all the snare changes, had a cocktail Ooh. kit coming out, the whole thing. But he's got an encyclopedic knowledge of how they record, what they do, and he's a huge music fan. His knowledge is unbeatable, you know, yeah. and, he, and he and he does. When we did the tour, I had 12 snare changes. And he every snare was tuned for a reason. Right. Whether it's old blues, and he'd make the snare sound like it came from the 30s and 40s. And some were covered in gaffer. You couldn't see any head. It was just all gaffer. But oh, it wow. sounded right. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't play at it. He, yeah. he really studies what he's going to do. And he, he pays homage to everybody. Yeah. And, and the thing he with Charlie well. is that Charlie you know, love Steve's playing and stuff, and he's the right man. Yes. You know, and have there been any reviews, uh, any comment? I mean, I haven't yeah, heard anything. It, well, there's a lot of people saying say, that, there are a lot of people saying they shouldn't do it. And yeah. then there's a lot of people saying he's, he's doing a great job. There was one, there was, if you want to call it a bad review, and it really isn't a bad review, they did a private show a few weeks mm -hmm. ago here in, in Boston uh, for the owner of the New England Patriots football team and some video about a minute or two of, of satisfaction leaked out um, into the world. And people immediately said, oh, it's, it's not Charlie. I mean, it, and it didn't, it was their first gig. It was in a tent. Oh man. Yeah, you know. And, For 25 and million pounds. Yeah, probably. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but since after that- After tax. I, yeah, after tax, yeah, exactly, <laughs> net, net. Um, but everything I've heard since that time Andy has been all positive. Everybody that has been to the actual show has said, 
he's he's really paying homage to Charlie. I mean, like the parts are, you know, he's not playing it note for note, but he's 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 got Charlie's vibe as much yeah. as anyone. I can't have. I can't yeah. imagine it doesn't sound great. Oh yeah. 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 It's going to be too. And they, be they, they have to yeah. do it if they if they want to do it because of all the all those songs, you know. Yeah. I mean that's what yeah. People, uh, I felt the same way. Well, I had this thing when Steely Dan went back out without Steve Gadd. You know, it was kind of like, really? You know. <laughs> well, oh, the, Steve fl Gadd. the flip side of the coin is when you say, should these bands do it or not, is that if you look at it from the surviving members' point of view, whether it's Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey, yeah. or whether it's Mick and Keith or whoever, mm -hmm. they've spent their life building up a band. And so just because one of them dies, these guys can't be expected to give up what they've spent their life building. So yeah. I understand like the surviving members think, well, listen, this is our life. Yeah. We, yeah. we built this from nothing since we were yeah. teenagers. We got it. We got to keep going. I I get both sides of it. Yeah, yeah. It's phenomenal that they're doing it anyway. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. It, is. it is. Seriously. Yeah. Come and, on. You know, I mean, and, come and on. It's, it's the and same then, with the Who. You know, yeah. I I joined I joined the Who with Zach when he got the gig <laughs> in '95, and um, he's made it his gig. Yeah, right. he and, sounds great too. He's yeah. great in that and, shape. And, and Zach learned from records, you know. So yeah. every, everyone, there's these stories that Keith Moon taught him to play. He didn't. You know? <laughs> he, he did the same as I did. You just learned from playing from your favorite records. Yeah. And uh, when you see him play, you just forget about the past. Zach has made it his own gig. Yeah, yeah. that's nice. Pete, that's Pete, nice. Told him, Pete said, yeah. you know, you do what you need to do. He didn't, he didn't want a replica of Moon. Is and, he still that, got that gig? Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. I saw Pino. them last time they were in town. It sounded great. Pino yeah. left. P Pino left, yeah. Oh, he did. Yeah. I didn't realize. Oh, is yeah. it is it no, he, no Simon's he, son plays guitar, right? But it's it's uh Simon's son Ben. Yeah. He's going out with Roger as, as the drummer. Yeah. And um and so the, the bass player got replaced because my I, after I I finished. Um, my son took over for, well, you know that, John, my son took yeah. over for 10 yeah. years. And, um, and it, it, you know, it's the only band that's ever made me nervous. You know, before it gets <laughs> off, we, you know, we do the sound checks and everything. And then it's not until Zach used to jump on the kit and, and whack around the drums and look over to me and give me a thumbs up or maybe a thumbs down. <laughs> so so listen. No, I knew what we, sort of night I was in for. We <laughs> cut off Ricky and Steve. John, you, you said you wanted to get Ricky yeah, and I'd love Steve to hear, in, and, and we keep love cutting them off. So Rick's, Rick's a song that Rick likes, besides Tumbling Dice, Rick. What's a, what's a, we know why you like Tumbling Dice, but. Uh, no, I, I um, unfortunately have to leave soon, but I, I did want to say a couple of things. Uh, yeah, I did, I didn't know really know Charlie. I didn't get to meet him. I was at that Steel Wheels gig, to, uh, that tour gig in LA. And, you know, they said, do you want to go backstage and all of that stuff? Um, and I was on my way back. I probably, that's not my scene. I probably saw Stan Lynch back there and I thought, I just don't want to talk to anybody. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't need, I don't need to hang out with Stan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, I, I did see him play there. But but my 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 um, I guess anybody that played in any of the bands like like Andrew and I did when we were younger, played those uh, early Stone songs like we did with Giant in Giant and those things. They all played like uh, um, uh, Satisfaction and Brown Sugar and uh, all that kind of uh, Honky Tonk Woman and all that stuff. And I always actually wondered. Did he play on all of those things? Because there were always rumors tossed about, and I'm sure that he did. But when I had to cut, when we when we cut uh, Tumbling Dice on Linda Ronstadt's album, Waddy was playing guitar, and 
Wadi had played with Charlie and played with the Stones. I remember listening and watching Charlie play and more thinking I wanted to. So when I want to sound like somebody um, that plays simple, I like that or anyway, I kind of like to watch them play. You know, you can, yeah. you can see mm -hmm. them and more emulate how they look, which was mm -hmm. more what I, I actually was thinking of how Charlie looked when he played to cut that track. I've always loved that track for me. And, um, and I was sorry that I didn't get to hang out with him. I know that John, you were, you were setting up something where we were going to maybe hang out hang out one of these days but um uh another thing i wanted to say was listening to steve and yard about how generous i've always heard unbelievably great things about him i you know you hear oh charlie i saw charlie this if you talk to john christopher that's all he talks about is steve gad or charlie and, uh -huh. and and everyone says the same thing just what an unbelievably what a gentleman what a nice man. And listening to Steve talk about how generous he was, how kind he was, um, uh, and all the other things that he was. What I wanted to mention is, do you know who's not generous and not kind? And Steve Gadd. Uh, why, does anybody, why does anybody like Steve Gadd? Uh, I, don't I don't understand it. <laughs> what is the this thing? I don't, I don't understand it either. <laughs> I don't understand it either. <laughs> you know, I've played you know, with Steve. You know, I've been friends with Steve for almost as long as I've been with friends with Andrew Newmark. And, you know, I've been on gigs where I said, Steve, you sound great. He goes, yeah, I know. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like him. <laughs> So it's so refreshing. It's so refreshing to hear. No, I'm serious about this. It's more. No, we all know what what the Rolling Stones are and who they are. And 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 and, and Andy Newmark really said it. Uh, they're the sum of their parts is really what they are. They're better than they are individually. It's one of those bands where you put them. Sure together and they're just it's, it's, it's unstoppable it's unbeatable yeah even back when bill wyman was playing with them i mean now and oh, the other yeah. thing was when when you were talking about charlie leaving in the, the earlier conversation i i understand everything that everyone's saying about that but i i also felt like well bill wyman left and then uh, daryl jones came in and played and he sounds totally different but he sounds really great yeah and it's yeah. really great. I mean, when you look at the stones, it's just, it looks like, honestly, it just looks like one less guy in the band. And Jordan, um, Gad and I know Jordan from when he was just a kid. I mean, and we know how this guy plays. And I think you all said it. He, he's going to sound really great. And another thing I wanted to talk about was when Andy was talking about seeing the big band and how, how Charlie uh, didn't play any fills or anything now. You guys who know me well know that that was right up my alley. I loved hearing that, and I could hear Peter Erskine saying that, but I could also see John de Christopher at the gig. John de Christopher didn't hear a note of music. John de Christopher <laughs> only was drooling. He goes to those gigs to look at the vintage kits that Charlie's playing. <laughs> <laughs> none, none of that other shit mattered to him. He wouldn't care if he was just playing soloing all the way through or just playing ride cymbal and looking around having a cup of coffee. Like Steve likes to do that, you know, have his coffee while he's playing ride at the same time. Steve Gadd, I'm talking about. Well, <laughs> but I just wanted to address some of the earlier things I listened to <laughs> in the conversation so that I had something to say about it. Charlie was, I'm so sorry that I didn't get to hang out with him and meet him. Um, I think uh, we would have gotten along really great because I'm pretty jaded and I'm pretty quiet and try to just make jokes a lot to make people <laughs> laugh. But but I I think that, uh, you know, it just sounds like he was a great guy and uh, I am sorry we're, we're, we're not going to hear him play with the Stones. Yeah. 
Well I think said. <clears throat> well Beautiful, said. Rick. I, I, yes. I was going to say, Rick, I'm, I'm pretty sure that w the last time I saw him two years ago in July of 2019, I, I was on the vineyard and I left for the day. And I think you might have gone to Ireland or maybe even Italy. You, you were out of town. I think you were going to originally going to be my my date for the night. But oh, right, 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 right. Yes, yeah. yes. So I that would have been the time. That. I think I was yeah. leaving the country. Yes. On one of my many vacations. Yeah. Um, Hey, Ricky, yeah. is that your house in the vineyard? Yeah. Wow. Beautiful. First time I've seen it. I love that. Um, it's beautiful. Listen, I'm, I'm going to go, but I just okay, wanted to too. say, I don't know how Ricky made me think of something, but you know, when they announced that Charlie died, I, I really had this intense feeling of sadness. Me too, yeah. And it, it lasted. It lasted a good week or 10 days. I, mm -hmm. it, I couldn't shake it. It, mm. it hit me on an emotional level, unlike the death. Well, I mean, on a level with the death of John Lennon. Yeah. Wow. You know, yeah. That, yeah. Hit us, that hit everybody, right? Yeah. yeah. I really, sure. I, I was sad. Yeah. I, I you know, I, this, yeah. I, it, I feel the same time, way. It, it did not go away fast. It still hasn't sunken in really. Yeah. You know, somebody said that to me. A friend of mine said, you're really taking this hard. Did you know him? And I said, you know, I didn't. I knew of him. I know we knew each other. I would, you know, he he knew me as a not the great drummer from the not the great just, American drummer. Just a drummer. That's all he said. He but, said, you're but, just a drummer. But uh, no, I did say I did have a, a friend said, you're really taking this hard. I mean, you were your friends. I said, no, but I really am taking this hard. It's really, really hard. And then another friend of mine said, "It's all because we're part. We're all part of the same scene. You know, we're not eighty yet, but look at look around. I mean, look at Gad. For Christ's sake, <laughs> do you think, Ricky? Ricky, you think it's, it's because <laughs> we? You think it's because we kind of grew up with the Stones and the Beatles and all that? Yeah. Oh yeah. You think that has something yeah. to do with it? Yeah, it really does. Sure, yeah. sure. And also, no one has ever said." one bad thing about this guy like i don't know i don't mean any disrespect i don't know if i'd feel the same way i didn't feel the same way when keith moon died i thought yeah that makes sense because i had heard so many insane stories about this guy it was like every day above ground for that guy was a was a bonus yeah. for him bonus day he just, right he was killing himself yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah this was not a guy like that you know it was just shocking i gotta say i've had a strange reaction post charlie i've bought half a dozen ties <laughs> is that right seriously i swear wow. to god i have bought half a dozen size and i had a bespoke suit made i mean oh, that's... i i never do that i never do that and, and now i'm kind of getting into it for some reason you know how how like bob weir from the grateful dead after jerry garcia died he grew a beard he kind of took on this thing I don't know. I'm, I, I, I've bought a suit like having made and half a dozen ties. And I don't know what's going on. I kind of wanted to reach out and maybe you guys could, you know, help me with that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you in the discovery BQ next month. And in yeah. 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 Cats, cats, I'm going to go. I'm okay. Yeah. Me too. Me those too. Of you who I know, like, Ricky, I love seeing your face. Michael, yeah, same here. I love seeing you. I recognized you instantly. Steve, out in Arizona, I presume. Yeah. I love seeing your face. Yeah, and Yard, uh, yeah. I haven't seen you forever. I love yeah. seeing you. John, you too. And uh, yeah, it's great seeing all you guys, man. Yeah, but it's, likewise. It's 8.30 8 yeah. here, and my dinner's, uh, I got to eat dinner. Got to eat dinner. Okay. All right. So I'm out of here. Andy. Hey, fellas. All right, Andy. Hey, Andy. John, thank you for putting this together, John. Thank yeah, you, Michael. Jeff. Thank you, everybody. And Stanley, was there anything you wanted to say before we, before we close it out? Was there any any it's final just, words? It's, a, it's a, just such a pleasure to see all of you and to feel like I, I have some knowledge of you now. It's like I've, you've all been in the ether in my life you know everyone here has been in the ether and has had some infection on me and i've known i've known everyone by reputation here on the screen i've known everyone yeah and maybe have brushed into people but it's just it's a real treat for me as just as a man 
to, when yeah. I turn the computer off, I'm going to have a sense of like, hey, I know these guys and they know me. That makes me feel really good. I tell you, you know, Beautiful I've been doing this thing with some drummers ever since COVID started with Lenny White and Mike Clark and Greg Rico and David Garibaldi and myself three Whoa. times a week hmm. we would Zoom and I, I recorded all of them three times a week for a year like mm. a men's like a men's group you know <laughs> and, and everybody really can't wait to get there and so you can see why why it is it's it's nice to connect it's a beautiful thing and, yes yeah. anybody here call me anytime I stand. Stan, <laughs> a word, one word of advice. Sure. <laughs> Try to keep Steve Gadd in the ether. You don't want to get him too close. <laughs> keep him, hey. keep him in the ether. Right, right, right. Listen, I just, I just got to tell you one story before we go. Okay. This, this guy, he walks into a neighborhood bookstore. And he, there's a little girl behind the cash register and he goes up to her and he says, there's a new book out I'm looking for. It's written for men with small penises. And she thought for a minute and said, I don't think it's in yet. He said, yeah, that's the one. How much is it? <laughs> hey, where's the rim shot? Mic <laughs> drop. That's, that's staying in too. That's well before. So this is going to go to a podcast also. So for people who can't see, I want to thank Steve Gad, Michael Shreve, Stan Lynch, Rick Murata, John Ferraro, Steve Maxwell, Yard Gavrilovic, and missing from the screen is is Kenny Jones and Andy Newmark. But thank you all for doing this today. This has been a blast. I know uh, we had a few little technical things that that made it all the more fun, but uh, th this has been great. So I really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you, John. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Yeah. So same time tomorrow, we'll do the same thing again, and this time with a little bit more, you know, a little bit more spirit. <laughs> Thanks. Anytime, John. All right, you guys. Thank you, guys. Thanks. I love you guys. Love you all. Love you guys too. See you, you soon. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. <laughs>